And we know that we need more nuclear families, meaning a human male man and a woman to reproduce and to continue going on. And you have a bigger, stronger families when it comes to polygyny. Then what's the problem? Peace. I'm Coach Navier, one of the founders of um, Outstanding Personal Relationships and co-author with my wives of Let's Talk Polygyny, Uncensored. It's not like a piece of Fatima, Coach Fatima. It's good. I'm doing that. Excellent. That so now we know what to do um, <laughs> on a weekly basis. I'm All right, good stuff. Bad. Well, like we were saying, we are doing something new. And uh, 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 uh. All right, so we're doing something new, right? Meaning that some people will be able to ask us questions live through the Clubhouse app, which means you got to connect with us on Clubhouse, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. It's like a call in, but um, utilizing Clubhouse is the first time doing it. Nevertheless, uh, if you're on Facebook, YouTube, you can add all of us. Uh, Coach right. Nadir, Coach Fatima, Coach. Um, you see it. It's right on the screen. Coach uh, it's right on the screen. For those who are in Clubhouse, Maliki Clip, Salam Alaikum, out on the West Coast doing the thing. Uh, Sister Nafisa. We, you know, we're testing something out right now with coordinating things in uh, our audio live that we're doing the Q&A on polygyny and really just getting real about it and getting gritty. We'll be asking some questions. So if you are you want to ask some questions online, put a bunch of question marks before your question so we can really recognize it. What we're going to do is Coach Nyla is going to be facilitating asking different questions that we receive through email and online because it's easier than responding to so many people that flood our inboxes because right. we do believe in balance. Right. All right. So with that being said, she's restarting her phone. So inshallah, she'll be back shortly. Now, for those of you who this is your first time really seeing us or joining us, one, congratulations. You know, like, subscribe, share, all of that kind of good stuff, right? Because what? Because sharing is caring. <laughs> we don't have to say that. Sharing is caring. She would say that. But no. you know, like right now it's an, it's an impromptu live that we're doing. But I've been married to Coach Fatima for 26 years, and I've also been married to Coach Nyla for 11 years. So we've been practicing polygyny 11 years, right? And we do not stay in the same house. This is a common question. We stay in the same house. No, we don't do that. Um, when it comes also to scheduling, I told, you know, I figured the best, the best rotation for me that will work is a 24-hour schedule. I want to see my family pretty much every single day. All right, so I'm at, at each house pretty much at different times and stuff throughout the day. Actually, I start the day like that. So when it comes time for Fadger, we go to the, I pick my sons up, we go to the master or the monster pray. Um, right now it's at four o'clock in the morning. So I pick them up, go do some things early and then we do whatever we do. So it's a relatively simple thing when it comes to scheduling. But I also want to let you know, if you're new to polygyny or you're considering um, practicing polygyny, not to compare yourself to our chapter 11, like we're 11 years in it. If you're right. brand new year one or considering it a year three, you know, we had to go through some ups and downs, and that's what we're going to be sharing with you, um, some best practices when it comes to polygyny, because we've all made enough mistakes to write a book about it, which you're going to be hearing more about if you subscribe to our email Message. list uh, <laughs> called Let's Talk Polygyny as well. So prayerfully, um, we'll go from there. So Coach Nyla is on the line. I want to go ahead and check nice. her audio. Oh, and God. again, if you have questions and stuff like that, you will be able to do it live. If you Connecting with us on Clubhouse. If not, no worries. You still be able to do it. And we are going through the questions live on the screen. All right, there's a question online. Can you explain how polygyny became so stigmatized and monogamy became the norm? That's more of a historical thing. Matter of fact, I would suggest to um, consider purchasing this book by Dr. Nancy Cott. It's called uh, Public Vows. Public Vows. Because polygyny has been the norm for quite a long time. And she really goes into breaking down a lot of different cultures and societies in the way that the United States want to differentiate itself from the world um, is one of the ways is to put monogamy as the norm and really just push that as the thing. For example, you know, we still use the imperialist system, which, of course, when you have a country that's about imperialism. Uh, so we still are on inches instead of the metric <laughs> system. Right? right. We're still on Fahrenheit versus Celsius. 
you know what I'm saying, these differentiations. But she said it's really part, she broke it down to how it's actually part of um, the white supremacist identity. This is a white woman, professor from Harvard. This is not coaching out there's information. No, last right. week, a white woman got mad as soon as white supremacy was mentioned. But this is what she notes in her book. So that might better explain it for you, to you historically. But we know that, you know, collision is what it is. I mean, mm -hmm. when it comes to different jealousies and feelings and, right. and so on. But looking at it just in the last 200 years, you have to ask yourself how the world has changed. I mean, 200 years ago, what would you be riding? You'd be riding a Mustang horse. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or a buggy. You wouldn't yeah. be riding a car, wouldn't be flying airplanes. <laughs> if we look at it a thousand years ago, I mean, the, the advancement of technology in just the last a couple of centuries has been phenomenal, especially just the last century, last hundred years mm -hmm. has been um, really phenomenal, right. where it really changed the shift, even of the regular roles of a man and a wife or a husband and wife. So, you know, but that mm -hmm. that'd be a great book to kind of look at it from there, from a historical perspective. And I'm going to check back with um, Coach and Isla. Muy excelente. All right. So we just leave the phone over there and do the thing. <laughs> Name is dope. All right, so you got a question, sis? Uh, one of the questions is um, what is the purpose of feelings for your first life? This is for Coach Nadir, of course. <laughs> Did it change when you got into polygyny or when you married again? Um, because for some reason, they can't really grasp the the, the um, point of still having these feelings and this love for your initial wife while marrying someone else. Okay, can you sum, summarize that up? Because I really didn't understand the question. Did my feelings change for my first wife after practicing polygyny? Is that the question? Yes, that's the question. All right. Did my feelings change? Um, yeah, they changed. All right, they grew, they expanded, they allowed me to be more uh, sensitive to different things. It allowed me to be more aware of different things that aren't, they really don't cross your plate in monogamy. For example, you take things more for granted. So they expanded and got deeper and better and, and it helped me become more intentional. So now do you mean it, you may have meant like, did it lessen or something like that? Well, I'll give you an example. Being the father of 10 biological children, I had my first child, was really excited and stuff like that. Then I had my second child, and then my love for my first one just went down a little bit, right? And then I had my <laughs> third child, and then that love was all in the third child, and my first and the second got even less. And then the fourth daughter I had, because I had girls first, then like the, the love for my first three daughters got even smaller. And then I had a son, and then it was like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do with the love for the daughters? It almost disappeared. Right, you see what I'm saying? It doesn't make any sense, does it? Right. See, the crazy thing about love is it's really expansive. It's not you can't really put in a box. You can't even lock it in. You don't even know, like when new human beings, new babies, as an example, because these are some of the closest relationships that we have, a new baby that you don't even know. Can exist for one day and the amount of love that you have for this child already to die for this child is amazing. It's, it's something that's put in our hearts. So, no, you can't. It's expansive. It's not something that uh, shrinks. You know what I'm saying? At least for me. And I haven't heard of anybody saying that either. Yeah, my love is it, shrunk. Or if that's what, you know, the implication usually is, because that's what the fear is of a uh, of what's considered an initial wife or a first wife, is that if you marry again, there's either something wrong or I'm missing something or now I'm going to lose the love and all this kind of stuff is going to be replaced. All of these different negative assumptions that usually aren't even uh, founded anywhere. So perfectly that helped. Hey, Coach, could I, could I ask your wife a question, if you, if you permit it? Go ahead, uh, Maliki, please. Maliki is a, can you introduce yourself, bro? I mean, I know this brother, how many like, I've known him for a very short time, but he's like, a, he's already a brother to me. And um, he's on Clubhouse and all this stuff as well. So this is actually coming from some of our Clubhouse audience. Well, go ahead, Ali. Hey, Zach, my name is Ali. I'm in my, my late 40s, converted to Islam 29 years ago in prison. You know, I got a podcast, my little click, uh, Reflections in the Forest. Uh, just a short intro about myself. Um, I, I was I was interested in asking from a woman's perspective. Uh, polygyny has been thrown my way a few times with uh, women that I have been uh, married to in the past. Uh, for example, like their friends want to like to team up, uh, but I, I I decided against it because I really didn't want it. I didn't want to deal with it and I didn't want to you know break myself financially I wanted to know from a woman's point of view 
what is the main factor or factors which uh, have a woman say, no, no, no way, no, no, I'm not sharing my man, no, 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 not even a possibility from a woman's point of view. Thank you. Um, well, Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. For me, it was just fearing change, fearing loss, because sometimes women can, some, not all, but I know for me as a young bride, I've associated polygyny with loss. I was gonna lose something. My children were gonna lose something. It was gonna be too difficult. It was gonna be too rigid. Think about everything that was could go wrong, that could possibly go wrong versus everything that could go right. So once I changed my mindset of thinking about the positives versus the negatives, it helped me more. And I really had to, um, polygyny helped me strengthen my relationship with the law. So once I strengthened that, I, became, I made the offer understanding and guidance. And I always say this, and those are the things that helped me because Allah was listening to the du'a. He answered my du'a. He still is, but I'm still working on me. But I associated polygyny with that fear of loss. So, or, and also a fear of there might be something wrong with me if this does show up, because that's the narrative that um, I bought into very early. So that's really what it was. Just, and then the fear of change. A lot of reasons why we fear change is because something's going to change and we're used to what we're used to and we want to stick with what we're comfortable with. And when polygyny comes in or if the husband wants it, then he, you have to think about what's going to change in your life for him to facilitate polygyny in his life. So I liked having my husband around the house and my children. And then I got a little older and I said, well... <laughs> Maybe I need a little, a little assistance, but I didn't know that until polygyny entered Nadir's life, Coach Nadir's life. So, but initially, one thing I did learn about being married and being around a lot of married women is that some married women don't like single women because they're single and they think that in some way they'll end up, at, their husband will end up in polygyny. Like I've been uninvited to events. And I had a sister tell me, and I said, what is going on? I was going for 15 years to Iftars, and then it stopped. And a friend of mine said, Fatima, did you ever think that this, this, the mere, just the optics of seeing you reminds that sister of polygyny because your husband has another wife. So then just to get rid of that feeling, she doesn't invite you. I didn't realize it was that deep. But it was because she feared her husband would get another wife. He got one and it didn't have nothing to do with me. It didn't have anything to do with her. But I didn't think about it in, a, in that way. I was too busy in, inside my own head thinking about fear or maybe if he does it, I'd be deficient in some way in his mind. Because to me, I wasn't. So, But it was just um, a fear of loss in, on all angles for me. <laughs> Fantastic insight. Thank you for your answer. You're welcome, brothers. Welcome. Those who want to ask questions, make sure you raise your hand so we can know that you want to um, ask questions and then we can bring you up on the stage. Uh, Coach Batama, this is a question for you. Okay. I'm someone saying that um, the hardship um, in the beginning of polygyny, and it's interesting because you just answered <laughs> somewhat <laughs> this question, but it was, you know, I guess a little elaborate, uh, elaborating a little bit more. Uh, so the hardship um, in the beginning of polygyny is that the initial wife, the initial wife has to adapt to what I now call the half-life couple life, uh, you know, a uh, way of life where she has to learn to control her need and await her turn um, while dealing with the feelings of challenges of not being abandoned. Did you deal with that? Have you dealt with that? And if so, how have you overcame that? Or well, what do you, um, what advice do you give? One way I overcame it is, um, again, I've, I've strengthened my connection with Allah because I felt like polygyny was something to build me, stretch me. Um, there were so many blessings in being tested you know, there was so much that I had to do as far as self-work. And it, it made me refocus on a law is what happened. Because I got so lost in being a wife and a mother and chasing behind, you know, 
so many children, <laughs> six children at the time that I kind of got lost in the, in the sauce of family and being, you know, being a spouse and being a friend and being a granddaughter and being a daughter and ripping and running. And it just really challenged me to become more. So Dua helped me overcome also personal development and character building. I'm still doing that. I think that's a lifelong journey. Um, getting around positive women, positive couples that were willing to say, okay, I know this is not how you maybe envisioned it, but it's not an impossibility. That didn't mean I had to um, survive polygyny. I always like to say I, I thrive in it, but I made a decision to do so. So it's just a lot of self-education, a lot of reading. I started studying polygyny from an Islamic perspective and that helped my understanding so that I could reach a level of maturity where I could just communicate my concerns or ask questions that were difficult. So I did a lot of building on um, Fatima and wanting to show up better because I said, if I need to heal, I need to start here and um, hold myself accountable really and try to understand from a male perspective because I was just looking at how I felt as a wife. And I did deal with like abandonment and, but my, my mother didn't raise me. So one of my triggers was feelings of abandonment, um, not being in the know, not being told, not being prepared because my parents broke up when I was three. I've been with my grandmother raised me and my grandfather when I was 11 months old. So I constantly heard, oh, her grandparents raised her. Oh, her dad's not around. Oh, her mother didn't want her. I mean, people, kids can be vicious and then they get worse as they get older, unfortunately, into high school because then they start the rumor mill. So, um, and Coach Nadir came into my life when his parents were going through their divorce my grandparents' divorce was finalized the year I met him. So it was a lot of like attaching to one another through trauma, not just teenage angst and hormones and stuff like that. It was a lot of, I, he was traumatized, I was traumatized, and we were two traumatized teenagers. So, um, first of all, I wasn't that traumatized. It was for me, teenage hormones oh. and angst. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, anywho, to me, he was traumatized in his show. <laughs> so, um, you know, what else was it? It was, it was just understanding and learning about polygyny and what, what Allah said, what Rasul Salatu Islam, how he lived his life with his wives. And once I started to learn those things, then I could say, okay, this is the structure. <laughs> Maybe it's, you know, the way I did it was kind of skeletal, but I just inserted things where they needed to be so that I could just thrive in it and be happy. I wanted to be happy. I don't want to go, well, what is he doing? And it's not his day where I don't have him. He has to, he can't, he can't come see me. He can't see my co-wife when he wants to. He has to do things the way that Allah Ta'ala told him he has to do it. So it's not just, oh, the wife is at a loss. He can't see me when he, every single second when he wants to, he can't see my co-wife whenever he wants to. So it goes both ways for the wives and the husband. You know what I mean? So it's what you tell yourself. So if you say, well, I'm abandoned, then you're gonna feel abandoned. <laughs> Whether someone's doing that or not, because that's a really stiff uh, accusation, and, but you do feel lonely or you miss someone's presence, but that doesn't mean you're abandoned by that person. I remember, who was I saying? I did a, um, we have our relationship mastery inner circle. So today I trained, um, my co-wife trains, our husband trains. Um, so if you're interested, visit outstandingpersonalrelationship.com slash RM for relationship mastery. Here are three ways outstanding personal relationships can help you. One is by following us on our social medias. Follow us on IG at Outstanding Relationships and on Facebook and YouTube at Outstanding Personal Relationships. And make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell. Number two, make sure you head over to OutstandingPersonalRelationships.com and subscribe to the email list. From there, you will get downloads as well as updates, any and all updates. And you also get an update on the release of our new book, Let's Talk Polygyny, Uncensored. 
Number three, if you are serious about polygyny relationships and, and really developing fulfillment and happiness, make sure you register for our Relationship Mastery Inner Circle, which is members only, which is downloads, it includes access to us live on a weekly basis. So that's at outstandingpersonalrelationships.com slash RM. We'll see you soon. Assalamu alaikum. Peace. Peace.